So shall I start? Yes. Okay, okay so uh, it's about pointwise Fatu theorem and their converses. Uh, pointwise Fatu theorem is very well known. It's pretty classical, more than 100 years old. Uh, converses could be slightly new. Uh, let me first tell you what this talk is not about. It's not about almost everywhere convergence of constant integrals. It's about pointwise convergence. So let us start. So during 1903 to 6, Pierre Fatou worked on boundary convergence of constant integrals of basically signed measures defined on the open unit disk in C. So in this lecture, we'll talk about results revolving around two such theorems to by Fatou. They are the main results. But instead of the disk, we will prefer to present the results for the upper half space instead of the disk. So here is the definition of the usual standard notion of upper half space inside RD. Uh, so the boundary in this case, the topological boundary is RD. And Fatu proved these results only for the case D equals to one, but we will talk about the higher dimensional generalizations also. Uh, for us, uh, only thing I would like to mention that mu will always mean a Borel measure, which could be a sign measure, could be a complex measure. So when I say measure, uh, one shouldn't assume that it is non-negative. So we'll mostly talk about measures on locally compact house cross spaces. In our cases, it will be basically Euclidean spaces, such that the total variation of mu, that is mod mu, which is finite all, com all, all compact sets k. <laughs> okay. So I start with some elementary notions, which everybody knows, so I'll try to be quick there. So first notion is the symmetric derivative of a measure for any point x naught, the symmetric derivative called dc mu at x naught is defined to be this limit, which is the quotient of measure of a ball centered at x naught and radius r divided by the Lebesgue measure of the ball. M always stands for Lebesgue measure on appropriate dimensional Euclidean spaces. So whenever this limit exists, we say that the symmetric derivative of mu at x naught exists. And then we have the usual notion of Poisson kernel for x in RD, the definition of P1 is given here, which all of us know. And then one constructs PYX, which is cons uh, constructed by the standard dilation of P1. And one can write down the explicit expression, which is written here. Uh, this is a radial function on RD. Here, the constant CD is chosen in such a way that you want it to be the total integral to be equals to one because it is supposed to approximate the Dirac measure, the so called approximate identity. The Poisson integral of a measure mu then is simply a convolution. So we call it P mu x, comma y, which is mu convolution P y at x. The convolution is on RD, x is in RD, y is bigger than zero. So this P mu is a function on the upper half plane, upper half space, that is Rd plus one plus, and it defines a harmonic function. Okay. Uh, now we are in a position to uh, talk about first theorem of Fatu. The only point to note, to start with, that even if P mu xy is well-defined for a particular mu, the integral should make sense. It may not be continuous in Rd plus one closure. That means the space, including the boundary, and hence, the nature of convergence of that integral, the convolution integral to the boundary is a matter of concern. And because of the expression of the Poisson kernel, one actually can pretty easily see that if some point x0, y0, p mod mu x0, y0 is well defined, then it is actually well defined for all other points x0 in Rd plus 1 plus. Okay, so here is the first theorem of Fatu, which we know. That suppose mu is a finite sign measure on R, then for any point x0 in R, if the symmetric derivative of the measure at x0 is L, then limit y tending to zero, p mu x0 comma y is equals to L. So what it means is that if you come down to the point x0 through a line parallel to the y-axis, then the limit is equals to L. This usually go by the name radial convergence because in the disk picture, it means you are going according to the radius. The only point to remember here is Fatu basically said that existence of some kind of a derivative of the measure implies convergence of the points. Okay. The first important observation is due to Loomis. Uh, in 1943, Loomis observed that the reverse implication is false in general. The reverse implication would have meant that the convergence of the Poisson integral implies existence of the symmetric derivative, but that is false. However, if mu is assumed to be non-negative, 
then the reverse implication is true, which I have written here, that the existence of the limit, radial existence of the radial limit of the Poisson integral actually implies the existence of the symmetric derivative and the derivative is same as the limit of the Poisson integral. For d equals to one, it was proved by Loomis using some classical Taubérian theorem. For d bigger than one, it was proved by Rudin in 1978. And they looked at this reverse implication as a Taubérian theorem with mu non-negative being the Taubérian. Uses Wiener's Taubérian theorem on the multiplicative group zero infinity. So the first problem we are going to look at is <coughs> what is the role of the points of kernel in this theorem? So here is a generalization of Loomis and Rudin theorem. It's a recent generalization proved by John Prasarkar in 2021. So here you replace py by something called phi y, where phi y is defined exactly as py using the same formula of derivation, but there are certain conditions on phi. The first condition is phi is positive, radial, radially decreasing with total integral one. Then you need a technical condition called comparison condition, I will say more about it, why this condition is necessary. And then you have a very fundamental non-vanishing condition. It says that for all t in R, the integration of phi against normx power i t dx is nowhere at zero for all t. So just remember these two terms, comparison condition and non-vanishing condition. The theorem says that suppose phi is as above and mu is a non-negative measure such that for some y naught, that is at some height y naught, mu convolution phi y at origin is finite. Then for any x naught in R d, the limit as y going to zero, mu convolution phi y at x naught, if it is equals to L, then the symmetric derivative of mu at x naught is also equals to L. So this is actually the reverse implication of, Fatu, of what Fatu had proved for Poisson integral for signed measure. Here, the reverse implication has been proved for non-negative measures mu with respect to an arbitrary kernel phi. Now, if phi does not satisfy the non-vanishing condition, then one can actually construct a non-negative measure for which the theorem fails at some point x naught. So in some sense, the non-vanishing condition is necessary. The comparison condition is actually not required if you assume mu to be a finite measure or if you assume that it grows like Lebesgue measure of RT. Now, from where the comparison condition comes, that can be answered from the following. That necessity of the comparison condition was first shown by Saiki in 1996. His uh, idea was to generalize Fatu theorem for arbitrary kernels. That is, if you assume the existence of the symmetric derivative, from that you should be able to say that the radial limit of the convolution integral is L. That he could show. And there he needed the comparison condition on phi. And he could show that if you drop the comparison condition, then the theorem actually fails. However, non-vanishing condition is not required for this implication. So non-vanishing condition is actually required for the converse implication. So what Saiki had proved is basically an analog of Fatu's first theorem. And the theorem above is basically the theorem in the reverse direction. So that more or less takes care of uh, Fatu's first theorem of Fatu. <clears throat> we now go to more general notions of convergence slowly. Uh, the next case is of real hyperbolic spaces, HD. The real hyperbolic spaces has an upper half space model that can be written as x comma y, where x is in RD and y is positive. And on this upper, so it's topologically, it is simply the upper half space. There is no difference. But on this space, you now have the so-called hyperbolic metric, which is invariant under the group SOD1. And there is an SOD1 invariant Laplace Beltrami operator. There has to be, because there is a Riemannian metric. Yes one can actually see that if you just look at the classical upper half space, this expression is different from that of the classical Sokarnel. However, the sense that Py is obtained from P1 by the same technique of diagram, and that is what is important for us. Now it can be
So here, what we are going to do? Again, somebody says recording is in progress. No, that's, that's fine. fine. Please, that's fine. Okay. Okay. So what I'm trying to say here is that now I look at the same upper half space model, but with a different metric. And that is the case of real hyperbolic spaces. Real hyperbolic space has an upper half space model called HD. It is written X comma Y, where X is in RT, Y is bigger than zero. Uh, it actually should have been uh, D plus one dimension. It should have been called HD plus one, but that's okay. Now, this is the standard topological. It is the standard upper half plane, but you have a different metric on this space, which is the hyperbolic metric. And that is invariant under the group SOD comma one. And since you have a Riemannian metric, that Riemannian metric gives rise to a Laplace Beltrami operator. Since the metric is invariant under SOD1, the Laplace Beltrami operator is also invariant under SOD1. That Laplace Beltrami operator can be explicitly written down, which I have written down here as delta. Notice that when your D is equals to two, it comes down to y squared times the standard Laplacian. So the collection of harmonic functions in that case are same. Now, corresponding to that Laplacian, we have the points of Arnold, which can be written as PYX. The point to note here is, though the expression of the points of Arnold is slightly different from the Euclidean space, but they can be obtained from P1 using by the same rule of dilation as in the Euclidean space. Dilation plays a very important role here. Okay. Uh, if you if you get struck or you can't hear or understand, please ask me because I. I can't see anybody. I'm sort of. Uh, can I proceed? Yes. Okay. Now, <clears throat> this function p one actually it's such thing. It's a radial function because it's a radial function of x. P one satisfies the comparison condition and the non-vanishing condition as stated in the previous theorem. So we can apply the previous theorem. Hence, converse implication of Hapi's theorem actually holds for positive harmonic functions on these spaces. More general results. In fact, you can generalize the converse implication of Hapi's theorem instead of harmonic functions uh, for eigenfunctions of the Laplacian on these spaces with certain restrictions. Eigenfunctions u, satisfying Laplacian of u equals to lambda u, where lambda is strictly bigger than minus t minus one square by four. <clears throat> uh, the only thing is, uh, there exist positive eigenfunctions of Laplacian with eigenvalue equal to minus d minus one square by four, that case we could not solve. And eigenvalues less than minus d minus one square by four, such positive eigenfunctions do not exist. That is, what I'm trying to say is that take any eigenfunction of the Laplacian, which is positive, then its eigenvalue is necessarily bigger than or equals to minus d minus one square by four. So we could take care of all the values, which is bigger than d minus one square by four, but not equal to d minus one square by four. The problem what happens is, in that case, the associated points so integral is not an L1 function, and we run into serious trouble. Okay, so far, can I proceed? So, so far, what we have done is, if we go back to the previous slide, all I have done is, if you look at this theorem, this phi y has been replaced by a different kernel, which comes from real hyperbolic spaces, is the so-called Poisson kernel. That's all. So, we yeah. have shown that the radial limit of the Poisson integral implies existence of the symmetric derivative. Yes, Joe. Yes, uh, could you uh, please uh, recall you what phi? Could you please recall this, the conditions on phi in the previous? Slide? On phi? Yes. Okay, phi satisfies two conditions that is, comparison condition and non vanishing condition. To show that, I go back to the previous slide, it will be visible there. Comparison condition means this first condition, supremum phi y x by phi x, y bigger than zero, norm x bigger than one. This is finite. And non-vanishing condition is actually basically a non-vanishing of Fourier transform of certain function on the group zero infinity. That is what it is. So if phi satisfies these two conditions, then the theorem says 
that the radial limit of new convolution phi y at x naught equals to L implies the symmetric derivative of the measured mu at x naught is equals to L. And then I'm specializing this phi to the Poisson kernel of the real hyperbolic space simply because that Poisson kernel satisfies all the conditions which are being demanded in this theorem. That is what is written here that P1 satisfies the comparison and the non vanishing condition. Hence, converse implication of Fatu's theorem. So, what does converse implication of Fatu's theorem mean? Fatu's theorem means existence of derivative implies limit of Poisson integral. So, converse implication should mean existence of the limit of Poisson integral should imply derivative. That is what we are proving here. Okay, can I proceed? Yes. Okay, next. As I said that it is not really about Poisson integral, you can actually prove it for eigenfunctions of Laplacian. There is no magic there because for eigenfunctions also you have got a different kind of a Poisson kernel which behaves more or less similarly with uh, like the Poisson kernel from the harmonic functions. It doesn't happen on Euclidean spaces, but it happens on hyperbolic spaces or rank one symmetric spaces. Okay. However, there is a little problem here, as I said before, that we could prove our result for positive eigenfunctions of Laplacian, where eigenvalue is strictly bigger than minus d minus one square by four. However, there exist positive eigenfunctions of Laplacian with eigenvalue equal to minus d minus one square by four. And in that case, we couldn't do anything because those positive eigenfunctions are given with respect to a power of the Poisson kernel, and that kernel is not an L1 function. And hence, we had a trouble here. In fact, for these functions, uh, there were classical studies by Peter Zogren. Things are really complicated here. So we don't know what to do. So that case is still open. Okay, we proceed to the next case. Some questions and comments. Non-negativity of the measure seems to be a sufficient condition for the converse implication of Hathis theorem. It is not known whether it is necessary. This question is going to play an important role in the next topic which we are going to discuss. So far, all the converse starting from Loomis are only talking about non-negative measures, whereas Fatu talked about finite sign measures. They were not really non-negative. The converse implication requires non-negativity of the measure, which Rubin and Loomis viewed as a Tauberian condition. So the question is, is this, a necessary condition. It seems to be sufficient. Now, as we talked about real hyperbolic spaces, <clears throat> those of you who know can very well see that it also makes very good sense to ask for analogous results for complex hyperbolic spaces. And there is a bad news here. A counter example due to Rudin, actually Rudin gave an example of a non-negative measure, shows that, and within quote, I quote Rudin here, no trace of the theorem and its converse remains for complex hyperbolic spaces. We will present a very simple exposition to that counter example later because Rudin gives the counter example in his book on wall model. We will give a simple exposition in the upper half plane model, which everybody will be able to understand easily. The crux of the matter, why things go wrong, we don't know for sure, but our guess is the crux of the matter seems to be the notion of radiality which is involved on the boundary of these spaces. So for complex hyperbolic spaces, the relevant boundary is Heisenberg group of some appropriate dimension. It is the notion of radiality which is creating trouble here. That is, what do you mean by radial on Heisenberg group or more general to step mill potent groups? That is what is creating trouble. That is what we feel, but we may not be absolutely right. <clears throat> now, uh, it's a trivial import, uh, observation, which I will note here because it will play an important role later that everybody can see from definition. So it's a trivial but important observation that what actually symmetric derivative at x not equal to L means. It is if and only if it means mu convolution chi y at x not converges to L as y goes to C, where chi is indicator function of BC. So all we are saying is, that symmetric derivative of a measure at x naught equals to L implies an implied by 
the radial limit of mu convolution chi y at x naught is equal to L. That is pretty easy to see from the definition. So you can basically say that if you take your kernel to be the indicator function of the ball, V0, then from the definition, it follows that Fatu's theorem and its converse is actually true. You don't have no, to wonder. Yes, somebody said something. Shall I proceed or? Yeah, I think you can proceed. Maybe there was a disturbance. Okay. Is it okay so far? If I'm going very fast, let me know. I will, I will slow down. So once again, let me repeat, all I'm saying is something very trivial that the symmetric derivative of a measure at x naught is equals to L. It basically says that the Fatu's theorem and its converse is true if the Poisson kernel P1 is replaced by indicator function of the ball with radius one centered at zero. That follows straight away from the definition. Okay. Next, we come to non-tangential temperatures. So again, some well-known definition. First, we have to talk about something called non-tangential cone. So non-tangential cone is a set in the closure of Rd plus one plus with aperture alpha bigger than zero. It means all xy in Rd plus one plus such that norm x minus x naught is strictly less than alpha y. Alpha here is the aperture. So if you write it in two dimension, it will look like in the upper half space, you take a point x naught on the x axis and taking this as a vertex, draw a cone. That is what this gamma alpha x naught. And how much is the opening of the cone that depends on the aperture alpha. Now, why non-tangential cone comes? That's a long story, but let me first tell you what is non-tangential convergence. This is also a well-known notion that suppose I have a complex valued function u, defined on the upper half space, we say that it converges non-tangentially to L at X naught. If for every cone, that means alpha bigger than zero with vertex at X naught, limit Y tending to zero where XY is inside that cone, the limit is equals to L. So here we are not saying that we are going through line or anything. We could go through curves or any zigzag motion, but doesn't matter how you go towards the point x naught comma zero on the boundary. The point is you have to stay within two Luxman records, that is the boundary of the cones. So that is what non-tangential convergence means. It is important because of some classical example of little load to say that if you go to a point x naught comma zero, which is tangential to the boundary, then it may not converge to the limit. So in some sense, this non-tangential convergence is the, is the natural way of looking at the convergence of the point scientific gap, as we will see. Now, connected to this, I'm going to bring in some notion which is not very standard. <clears throat> that is called strong derivative of a measure. I haven't seen this notion in any textbook. It was devised by Rami and Ulvik in their paper in Transactions CNS in 1988. Uh, it will take some time to understand what strong derivative means. So strong derivative denoted by ds mu at a point x naught of a measure mu is L if for every ball b, b excess, the ball doesn't have to contain x naught, just any ball b, limit r tending to zero mu of x naught plus rb by Lebesgue measure of Rb is L, where Rb excess mean B Rx Rs. This should be true for every ball B. Then we say that the strong derivative of the measure at x naught is equals to L. Now, uh, do we have examples of measure or some points such that such a thing exists or not is not very clear from the definition right now. However, we have the following observation. For D equals to one, if the distribution function of a measure mu is f, then ds mu, that is the strong derivative of the measure at x naught is L, if and only if the distribution function is differentiable and its derivative is equals to L. Now, some similar notions I'm going to now talk about. The first one is Lebesgue point, 
all of us know what is Lebesgue point of a function. I have written it down because I am going to use Lebesgue point of a measure. So suppose x0 is a point in R d, then the Lebesgue point of a measure, if there exists a number L in C such that limit R tending to zero, the total variation of the measure mu minus Lm, where M is the Lebesgue measure, of the ball centered at x0 with radius R, quotiented by Lebesgue measure of the ball is equal to C. Then we say that X naught is a Lebesgue point of the measure mu. Uh, it can actually be shown that uh, the complement of the set of Lebesgue points of a measure as expected is zero. So almost every point is actually a Lebesgue point. Now let us denote by L the set of all Lebesgue points of a measure mu. Let S be the set of all points where the strong derivative of a measure mu exists. And let us say sim is all the points where the symmetric derivative of a measure mu exists. Then the relation between these sets is that L is strictly contained in S. That is, there exist points where the strong derivative exists, but that is not a Lebesgue point. And S is strictly contained in sim, that is, there exist measures and points where the symmetric derivative exists, but the strong derivative doesn't exist. The second strict inequality is actually pretty easy to see. What is hard is to see the first strict inequality because even existence of a measure and a point where strong derivative exists is not very easy to see. So that is what I have commented here that the first strict inequality was proved by Shapiro in 2006. He has actually given example of a measure and a point x naught where the strong derivative exists, but the point is not the Lebesgue, measure, Lebesgue point of that measure. The second strict inequality follows pretty trivially. You take mu to be the indicator function of open interval 0, 1, then one can check that the origin is actually a point where strong derivative does not exist, but the symmetric derivative exists. So in particular, the point zero is not the Lebesgue point because it is not even a point of strong derivative. So that means this kind of points, the strong derivatives do exist. So if I produce theorems about uh, points with strong derivative, those theorems are not null and void, they do exist. Now, what is the meaning of strong derivative? Well, one meaning which we can see easily is ds mu x naught suppose is equals to L, then this limit r tending to zero mu convolution chi ry x naught plus rx equals to L. This may look complicated for each x y in rd plus one plus, but what it actually means is that if you think of it as a function on the upper half plane, so which function I'm talking about? mu convolution chi y at x. That's a function on the upper half space. Think of that function. The strong derivative of the measure mu at x naught equals to L means that through all rays, which are emanating from the point x naught comma zero, this function on the upper half space is converging to the same number L. That is what we call multiradial limit. Because if one ray is parallel to the y-axis, then that is the radial limit according to Fatu. But here we are saying that these limits are basically through all the slanted lines which are converging to x naught. That follows if I assume that ds mu x naught equals to L. Now one would like to see whether it is even only. That means suppose all multiradial limits are actually equals to L. Does that mean that the strong derivative at x naught is equals to L, that is not very clear, not from the definition, okay? So I have more or less defined all the uh, notions which I will be needing. So let me get into Fatu's second theorem. Fatu's second theorem says that suppose mu is a finite signed measure with distribution function f, and suppose x naught is a point in R, if the distribution function is differentiable at x0 and the derivative is L, then the Poisson integral of the measure converges non-tangentially at x0 to L. And that is true for all alpha Riemann principle. That means through any cone with vertex at x0. This is what Fatu's second theorem says. So in the first case, we have assumed symmetric derivative. 
and then we got radial convergence of the Moisson integral. Here we assume existence of the derivative of the distribution function, and then we get more the non-tangential convergence of the Moisson integral. And again, Loomis comes in the picture. The reverse implication is true for mu bigger than or equals to zero, but not true in general. Now, what one tries to think about that what should be the higher dimensional generalization of this result of path. Now, higher dimensional interpretation of F prime is a serious issue here. Now, Rami and Ulrich was the first, they interpreted this F prime as the strong derivative of the measured mu. So the relevant questions are, what is the higher dimensional analog of Fatu's result? Can non-negativity of mu be relaxed for the reverse implication? Because earlier we have seen for symmetric derivative and radial convergence, non-negativity was playing a very fundamental role. So can that be relaxed? That's a relevant question. And can the Poisson kernel be replaced by more general class of kernels as we have done before? Okay. So some of these questions, the answer to these we know, and that is what I'm going to present. The first result is due to Rami and Ulrich that appeared in Transamus 1988. It says that suppose mu is a non-negative measure on RD and X naught is any point, then existence of the strong derivative of the measure at X naught. Yes. Uh, Somebody says anything? Anything wrong? No, just neglect that somebody was whispering oh. somewhere. Okay, okay. So, uh, so they say that if mu is non-negative, then the existence of the strong derivative is equivalent to existence of the non-tangential convergence of the Poisson integral. More precisely, if the strong derivative is equals to L, that implies an implied by the non-tangential limit of the Poisson integral at x naught is also equals to L. However, here it's not really a several variable generalization of Fatu's theorem because non-negativity of mu has already been assumed. So this does not give rise to several variable generalization of Fatu's theorem and let alone the converse. This result was later generalized uh, by a fundamental paper by Brochard and Sevelier in Acta Math in 1990 for measures which are not necessarily non-negative. And <clears throat> this is an observation of Rubin that using the characterization of positive harmonic functions U on the upper half space, which I have written down here, that any positive harmonic function U on the upper half space looks like Cy plus mu convolution Py at x. So it's essentially points by integral plus a factor, which is Cy. So in the, in the, in the topological language, basically one says that the Martin compactification of the upper half space is RD union the point at infinity. RD gives rise to the classical point integral and the point at infinity gives rise to CY. This measure mu which appears in this expression is called the boundary measure of that positive harmonic function. And if you look at the above theorem, it is basically talking about mu convolution PY, true, but since we are interested in y tending to zero, the first factor appearing in the expression of uxy, which is cy, does not really play any role. So the above result can also be written in terms of non-tangential convergence of positive harmonic functions to the boundary. So what I mean is, take any positive harmonic function on the upper half space, then it comes equipped with a boundary measured mu, then the non-tangential convergence of this positive harmonic function at a given point x naught is equivalent to the existence of the strong derivative of the boundary measure at that point. That is what the result of Rami and Ulrich actually gives us. But this is not yet generalization of Fatu's theorem because of non-negativity. Okay. We now come to the work of Brochard and Chevalier. This is a very fundamental paper. I simply love that paper. Okay, so I start with some conditions and right now I will not be in a position to tell you from where all these conditions come. So I will urge people to look at this paper. Uh, this is a paper which, uh, which according to me is fantastic. Okay, a measure mu 
not necessarily non-negative because I said by a measure mu, I will mean sine measure as well as complex measures, satisfies condition H if P mod mu xy, that means I mean the Poisson integral of the measure mod mu minus modulus of the Poisson integral if that is bounded in B0 or intersection R plus D plus one, R plus D plus one, the, basically the upper half space, and B0R is a ball of radius R with center at zero in R D plus one. So if you try to look at this set, it's basically a solid upper hemisphere. So this is where we want this function to be bounded. That is what condition H implies. Then comes condition H prime. It says that the same function is bounded in just one portion of the y axis passing through origin, that is zero cross zero comma one. So first x is zero and y is lying between zero and one. However, this one is not very important. Any positive number epsilon will do. Using that, it's trivial to see that condition H actually implies condition H prime. Uh, I will just say that this condition, Brochard and Chevalier came by considering the Green's function of the measure mod mu on the upper half space. So it's not just an arbitrary trial and error, it can't be. Okay, so what is the theorem? Well, the theorem is the following, that if mu satisfies the condition H prime, then the strong derivative at the origin equals to L implies the Poisson integral converges non-tangentially to L at the origin. And they have also shown that if mu does not satisfy condition H prime, then they can, uh, they can give example of a measure mu such that its Poisson integral converges non-tangentially at the origin, but the strong derivative is not equals to L. So for them, the condition H prime is actually necessary. The second condition implies the second theorem implies that if mu satisfies more, that is mu satisfies which is stronger than the condition H prime, then the existence of the Poisson integral at the origin to L is equivalent to the existence of the strong derivative mu uh, at the origin to be equals to L. According to me, this generalizes Hattu's theorem as well as its converse, because one can actually show that finite sign measures on real line does satisfy condition H. So according to Brochard and Chevalier, the measures which are not necessarily non-negative for them, if Fatu's theorem and its reverse implication has to be true, then mu must satisfy condition H. Now that is more or less all as far as Fatu theorem is concerned, but Brochard and Chevalier goes further. They talk about more general kernels, but one thing I would like to mention here, I have talked only about Fatu's theorem at the origin, but you might be interested in proving Fatu's theorem at other points. That means the existence of the strong derivative I might exist, I might assume at other point x naught, and I want to have non-tangential convergence at other point x naught. Then the condition h and h prime needs to be changed where B0R has to be replaced by bx not r and things like that, okay? The conditions needs to be changed. Okay. Now, analogous results were also proved by Brochard and Chevalier for radial, radially decreasing non-negative kernels k with norm k1 equals to one. The fundamental observation here is something, and that will give me a new understanding of the strong derivative. Their fundamental observation in this direction is the following. That suppose mu is a measure such that the function mod mu convolution phi y x minus mod of mu convolution phi y x satisfies h. Then ds mu zero equals to L if and only if mu convolution phi y x converges to L non-tangentially at zero zero. So according to Brochard and Chevalier, the meaning of strong derivative of a measure at zero is given by, uh, by the condition H for the function which we have written above, 
what is chi here? Chi is the integrator function of p zero one. So it gives a much stronger criteria than the multiradial convergence of the associated uh, convolution function, mu convolution chi y at x. It actually is equivalent to non-tangential convergence. And using certain techniques from this fact, they derive it for other kernel scale. Now, this theorem is surprising because of many reasons. Because before Brochard and Chevalier, whoever has worked with this kind of results, uh, they have uh, uh, used the full power of the fact that they are dealing with some harmonic functions. They are dealing with Poisson kernels. So properties of harmonic functions played a role. So one st statement I have written here, the proof of Ramey and Ulrich crucially uses Montel's theorem for harmonic functions. Now, this technique cannot be applied if the Poisson kernel is replaced by some other kernel which has no PDE connection. However, Brochard and Chevalier had managed exactly to achieve that for more general radial kernels and that too for measures which are not necessarily non-negative. So that's a big achievement as far as these problems are concerned. So this is more or less I, what I wanted to say about Euclidean spaces. Uh, I just wanted to ask uh, here that the uh, the condition like H, I mean, are there some examples known other than the, like some non-trivial examples of such measures? Uh, yes, 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 we do have examples. The paper of Brochard and Chevalier is full of examples and counter examples, which satisfies. For example, if your measure is non-negative, for example, then it's trivially true, okay? Okay. That you can see because mod mu is same as equals to mu, right? Yeah. And the convolution function mm -hmm. is also non-negative. So it generalizes the result of Rani and Ulrich. Any non-negative measure satisfies condition H. And not only that, if you take any measure whose density, let us say, is in L1 intersection L infinity, then it's actually pretty easy to see that all those measures will actually satisfy condition H. Okay. Mm -hmm. Because if you look at the convolution, you can take the bound of F out and then the integration of Poisson kernel will give rise to one. So boundedness is not a problem. Mm -hmm. okay. okay. So there are ample examples of measures and, satisfying uh, this. Also measures satisfying this property, can something be said about those measures? I mean, uh, what, what, tell me the question. That the measures which satisfy this, prop, this uh, condition. So are there some uh -huh. necessary conditions on the measure also? Uh, that 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 I am not very sure. That you you actually trying to find a condition which will ensure condition H, right? Yes, and also some more information. So if this condition is satisfied, uh, of course there is this information about the strong derivative. Okay. And yeah. contingential convergence of Poisson Yeah. Okay. They are same. That is what it is saying. Uh -huh. Yes. And then by hand you can actually check examples of measures which satisfies condition H, as I said, that any non-negative measure will certainly do. Uh, of course, with well-defined points and integrals, they cannot go arbitrarily rapidly. That condition is always there, that uh, points and integral should make sense. But if it is non-negative, then it satisfies all these properties. And then otherwise, you can look at measures of the form F times DF, where f is in L1 intersection L infinity, then also it's pretty easy to see that they will satisfy condition H. But there could be many others. There could be many singular measures satisfying this. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Now, take a deep breath. A standard generalization of the upper half space is a solvable Lie group, which is a semi dated product of n with zero infinity, which I write as R plus to set space where N is a particular kind of a two-step nilpotent Lie group, the so-called Heisenberg type groups. I write elements as X comma Z, where zero Z denotes the center of the group N. I assume everybody knows the gen definition of Heisenberg type groups, because that would be too time consuming to explain what it is. Uh, now, the beauty is that the group zero infinity acts on N, as non-isotropic dilation. I have written down the formula that in the non-central coordinate, you have multiplication by root A and the central coordinate, it is multiplying by A. Many people use A and A square, but I feel better to use root A and A. 
every for given any a in r plus delta a defines an automorphism of n and hence zero infinity acts on n by automorphism and then you can construct a semi direct product that is what we called g that's a solvable leg group bad news is this group is non unimodular but it doesn't bother us uh, n is actually a special kind of two step nilpotent leg group since i did not define it i simply bypass that by saying that typical examples are heisenberg group and iwasawa n part of connected non compact semi simple leg groups of real rank 1 but they actually give rise to a very small class of h type groups it's a huge class the point is on g there exists a g invariant riemannian metric which gives rise to a g invariant laplace beltrami operator delta and then you have an associated points of kernel p which can be explicitly written down we will write it down to show some important point and another important thing is that on this group n you have a kind of a norm not really a norm because it's not a vector space you cannot talk about a norm but you have something called coranby norm which has this explicit expression uh, norm x to the power 4 so what is this norm x well x comes from rn so it's the usual euclidean norm of x then the m dimensional euclidean norm on z so you have norm x power 4 plus 16 norm z square power half this is called the coranby norm there are many other norms the point is that the coranby norm satisfies these two important properties i have forgotten a comma here sorry that this norm behaves very well with respect to the dilation that is norm of delta a n is a times d of n and then d of n n1 i'm talking about the group product here on the group n is lesser equals to tau d times dn plus dn1 so almost you have a triangle inequality here okay uh, now one can actually show that there is nothing great about foreign we norm here you can have other norms satisfying these properties these are called homogeneous norms and any two homogeneous norms are actually equivalent but I will like to remember just for two or three minutes the expression of the Coran V norm that you have a norm x power four and the norm z square putting together that appears in the Coran V norm. That is going to be important for us. Okay. Huh. Take another deep breath. Now, using the Coran V norm, we can actually define an n invariant metric D on the group N. This can be used to define balls symmetric derivative and strong derivative of measures on n. So if, if I go back to the previous slide a little bit, I just want you to observe that the group G is n semi-direct R plus. So I think of n as boundary and R plus as analogous to Y axis. So for me, G is an analog of the upper half space whose topological boundary looks like n. There are other reasons to say why n is boundary, but since I don't need it, I will not get into that. There are other reasons to call it boundary apart from topological considerations. Swagato. Okay. Swagato. Yes, sir. Yeah, you forgot that one fourth. It is not one half. It is homogeneous of degree. Ah. Here it right, is. Right, right. One fourth. Square root right, will come. Right, right. It should be. Here square root right. will come. Right. Should be one fourth. Right. The homogeneity. Right. It should be one fourth. Yes, yes, I want that. So it should be one for otherwise it won't come. Oh, no, uh, no. See, my dilation is root A in X. No, you said square root. Power half. So if I put root A, uh, then it will be a square coming out. So from Z also a square comes out. So power half means A comes out, right? Yeah, usually the norm is defined with one fourth. Why are you taking it half here? Because because my dilation is root a, a not a, a square. So you don't want uh, the other one, the, the the usual thing. No, no. Okay. Okay. So what is the reason? Uh, we have we have followed Sigan perhaps uh, no symmetric spaces perhaps where root a, a has been used by Yanker that's why we are following that oh okay okay, okay. 
Now, so using the Corambi norm on N, we can define a metric, which is in N invariant, and then we can define balls. We can analogously define symmetric derivative. Since we have dilation, we can also talk about strong derivatives. So everything makes sense on the boundary as in the previous case. The next, we have an analog of form that was defined by Quarandi while dealing with almost everywhere uh, Hartwood theorems for rank one symmetric spaces. So there, uh, they don't talk about non-tangential convergence. They talk about admissible convergence and define something called admissible region. But for us, it doesn't really make any difference. It is, again, an analog of the non-tangential phone. So your space is n comma a, where n is coming from n, and a is coming from r plus. So you take a point in the boundary, which is n, call it n naught, fix an aperture alpha. So gamma alpha n naught is usually defined as n comma a, such that the distance between n naught and n is strictly less than alpha. So this is my analog of non-tangential cone in the context of the group G. Now we come to the notion of Poisson kernel. So the explicit expression is not going to help you because I'm not going to prove the theorem. Only two things I will like you to notice here that first believe me that this is Poisson kernel, it's written in papers. That PAN, the way PAN is defined is exactly analogous to Euclidean spaces. It's the same role of dilation that you balance by a power minus q so that the integral becomes same as the, the integral of p1. And the most important thing here, that if you still remember the expression of the Corandi norm, that this function p, which has been defined on n, is not really a radial function. Earlier in the Fatu theorem and all its generalization, we very carefully have chosen kernels which are radial kernels. But here we have interacted with a kernel which is not radial with respect to the Koran B metric. Okay. Now, if we define P n comma n as P a n, then it's well known that this is a harmonic function. And as I mentioned before, an important difference with R D is P is not radial with respect to the Koran B norm. However, in all the previous theorems, the radiality of the kernel plays a very important role. Even Brochard and Chevalier have dealt with kernels which are radial. But here, naturally, what arises is not radial. Okay. Not in the sense of Koran B norm. Heisen, Heisenberg group is a little complicated. You have actually two notions of radiality. One is with respect to Koran B norm. And another is from the viewpoint of Gelfand pairs. But this second notion of radiality with respect to Gelfand pairs is pretty restrictive. It is not, uh, uh, you know, uh, you cannot generalize it for, for uh, nil potent leg groups of higher dimension. But with respect to homogeneous norms, one can. So one is not really very sure which is the correct notion of radiality which one has to look at. Anyway, we have worked with the Koran B metric because that helps us in defining balls, symmetric derivative, and strong derivative, and so on. OK, so once we know all these quantities, we can define my integral of a measure exactly the same way, new convolution PA at n. Only thing one needs to remember, obviously, the convolution is on the group n here. Now, the Martin compactification of G is known because of Demek and Ricci in the 1992 Journal of Geometric Analysis paper. Martin compactification basically tells you what all positive harmonic functions look like. So they prove that if you use a positive harmonic function on G, then there exists a unique non-negative measure mu on N, which I'm going to call boundary measure of U, such that U N A is C A power Q plus mu convolution P A at N. So any positive harmonic function look like that. In fact, their result is more general. Similar characterization is actually available for positive eigenfunctions of Laplacian with eigenvalues of the form beta square minus q square by four, where beta is in R. Using certain powers of Poisson kernel, uh, it's the same Poisson kernel, but you have to use certain powers, which I don't want to get into because uh, I'm not going to state those results because it will, it will, it will take more time. Uh, the only thing to notice here is that, uh, that there is a, uh, that if you have a positive eigenfunction of Laplacian on G, then the eigenvalue must be bigger than or equals to minus Q square by four. 
below that you cannot have any positive eigenfunction of the Laplace. Okay. So here, let me talk about Rudin's counter example. <clears throat> so take n to be h1. My dilation is this delta a. The Poisson kernel is given by this formula. One defines a measure on h1 by concentrating the measure on the center of the group. So it's a singular measure. And then if you do direct computation, it turns out if E is the identity of the Heisenberg group, then mu of BER by M of BER is 2 pi to the power minus 2 for all A. And mu convolution PA at E is equals to pi to the power minus 2 for all A. So if you take a limit A tending to 0 or limit R tending to 0, it doesn't make any difference. So those two limits are different. That means Fatou's theorem fails for non-negative measures. Of course, the reverse implication also fails for non-negative measures. So as far as complex hyperbolic spaces are concerned, so that's what I've written. So first Fatou theorem and its converse both fails for a non-negative measure on the complex hyperbolic space SU21 model 2. So there is no hope of reviving uh, the first theorem of Fatou unless you change your notion of radiality, notion of balls, notions of symmetric derivatives, everything needs to be changed. Otherwise, it's false. Uh, this is not my counter example. Rudin has given this counter example in his book, but it is in the ball model. It looks unnecessarily complicated. On upper half space model, it's simple. So where do we go from here? Well, we still have this theorem, a recent theorem which we have proved that the theorem of Ravi and Ulrich still survives on the group G. So suppose U is a positive harmonic function on G with boundary measure mu. As I said before, that on any positive harmonic function is almost Poisson integral of a measure. That measure is called the boundary measure. So fix a point n not in n, and suppose L is a number, then the add if the Poisson integral converges to L in the admissible region at a naught, then it is equivalent to saying that the strong derivative of the measure at N naught is equal to L. The proof uh, uses analogs of Montel's theorem, which has been proved recently in 2012, and some other things uh, which we will not uh, get into. But the whole point is that as far as the major mu is non-negative, Fatou's theorem and its converse both survives even on this generalized upper half space called G. In fact, using real analyticity of the Poisson kernel, it can be shown that for a positive harmonic function U, if for some aperture eta, you have non-tangential convergence at N naught inside a cone with aperture eta, then you have non-tangential limit at a naught to be equal to same L through any cone with any aperture alpha beta okay. That follows from this theorem as a bulk product. The previous theorem can actually be formulated and proved for positive eigenfunctions of delta on G with eigenvalue beta square minus rho square with beta in R plus, as I said before, if beta is equals to zero, it makes sense to ask this question, but we couldn't settle it. Because again, the same problem, the associated Poisson kernel is not integrable. It is basically something like square root of the Poisson kernel, okay, which is in L2, but not in L1. And then we didn't know how to handle it. But for eigenfunctions, you do have Fatou's theorem and its, uh, and its relationship with the strong derivative. Now we are still working on this problem. So work is in progress to see whether non-negativity of the measure can be replaced by conditions similar to that of Brochard and Chevalier. Thank you. Okay, thank you for a very nice lecture. So are there any questions? So Agato, in your last theorem, what is G? Is the Heisenberg group or? No, no, any, any. Any is n n semi direct zero infinity. Oh, anything. Okay. N. Yeah. 
So if you take the power of a Python kernel and convolve with it, you have some problems. For some yes. powers, you have a problem. Right? Yes, you know, sir, it's something like uh, Koranvi and those people, they have worked on almost everywhere convergence of Fatu theorem on rank one symmetric spaces, right? Yeah. And they have yeah. gone to even eigenfunctions of Laplacian. Mm. Now, eigenfunctions of the Laplacian at the bottom of the spectra, that means when you have the eigenvalue minus rho square, the yeah. corresponding Poisson kernel is actually square root of the Poisson kernel, which is not in L1. Hmm. Um, that is the case which Peter Zogren has dealt with, and he got some very complicated domains with complicated notions of convergence. So I don't know whether these theorems can be done there. The main problem is you don't have an approximate identity to deal with. Yeah, for that you need the proper integrable. Exactly, the proper power. Yeah. Yes, that power is getting down, and that's why you got stuck. Uh, I just uh, have another question that uh, so here you are taking the full Laplacian, right? The Poisson kernel with respect to the full Laplacian. Uh, in which theorem? In, in Heisenberg me? group. Uh, in the. Um, no, I haven't. I haven't talked about Heisenberg group. See, uh, yes, let the, me go back and it will the be. The semi-direct product which you defined. Uh, uh, right, right. I talked about, uh, I talked about uh, the group uh, which I call G because S I have used somewhere else. Let me go back there. See, G is N semi-direct R plus, okay? So on this space, you have a Riemannian metric. And what is a typical example of this space? Typical example of this space is G mod K, where G is a rank one semi-simple metric. So there you already have a Riemannian metric and you have a Laplace Beltrami operator, mm -hmm. okay? It has nothing to do with the sub-Laplacian of N. Okay. But, but suppose you ask the question that suppose I want to deal with the heat equation, viewing n as the space and zero infinity is the time variable, then I should have looked at the sub-Laplacian uh, minus del del t. But that's not what I am looking at. I am looking at the Laplace Beltrami of this space. Yes. Yeah. Which actually generalizes the, the Laplacian of the symmetric spaces. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, the other thing which you mentioned for the heat equation, uh, uh, so uh, is there some work done in that direction? Yes, yes, it's pretty general actually that instead of N, you can take any homogeneous group, you can take the sub Laplacian on the homogeneous group and you can look at the heat kernel and you can try to play this game, it works out okay. that you get, uh, non-tangential convergence again is equivalent to the existence of the strong derivative, but only so far for non-negative measures. Joanko is trying to see whether it can be extended outside the class of non-negative measures. You need appropriate conditions like H, whether the things work out there right now, we do not know. Mm -hmm. Okay. But in the, for the case of non-negative measures, in huge generality, it is actually true. Uh -huh. Okay, thank you. The whole point here, as I was trying to say, is uh, that so far everybody was working with radial kernel. There was only one possibility whom I did not mention, I should have, that is Logunov. He worked with eigenfunctions of Laplacian in the Euclidean setting, and his work indicates sort of that radiality of the kernel is not really essential. You should be able to manage if you have radial estimates of very strong kind, uh, which actually we have for points of kernel and heat kernel. That is that is what helped us improving these results. Mm -hmm. Who, whose paper are you talking about? Whose work? Uh, which uh, Laguna? Who is Laguna? How do you, it's a it's a paper. How do you, uh, how do you spell his name? Uh, a. A. Logunov. 
L O G U N O V Logunov. It appeared in some algebra I analysis. He has recently written lots of papers with Sagun Chanilo. Uh -huh. Is from Princeton? Uh, that I don't know, but his papers are pretty difficult to read. Is the one you mentioned? Is it an old one or a recent one? Logunov, no, it's pretty recent. In okay. it's 2016. Okay. Logunov's paper is in 2016. That is the first paper where he got a hint that you might relax radiality. You might uh, consider kernels, which has good radial estimates. Mm -hmm. okay. Shall I stop share or there are further questions? Are there uh, further questions? If not, then uh, let's thank the speaker for a wonderful talk.